everyone! Today we reach the pinnacle of the class, the last big overarching concept that we're going to bring in. We started by thinking about energy and entropy balances and how they applied to unit operations, systems, and cycles. And then we moved on to thinking about the behavior of fluids and how we describe how fluids behave uh, and model how fluids behave both for single and multi-component systems with equations of state and activity models and all the fun things you can do with activity models once you know that you have them available. Now we're going to talk about reactions. Uh, but first, a little bit of philosophy. All of those things that I just talked about from energy and entropy through to reactions are secretly solving the same equation over and over and over and over again. And you're like, but really? And I'm like, yes, but really. So when we look at those three areas that I mentioned, how I group up the class, um, what we're doing each time as we move from one to the next to the next is we are relaxing a constraint on the system. And these constraints allow us to solve simple versions of the equations rather than the fully complex reality of the equation every single time. So, for example, when we look at just energy balances, we don't even worry about entropy yet, we don't worry about phase change, we don't worry about fluids doing weird things, we don't worry about reactions happening. We only can concentrate on just energy moving around. And that's, we know that's not the full picture. In fact, that's not even the full picture of how you might do an energy balance, right? So, uh, when we do energy balances, we only allow energy to change. When we bring in the entropy balances, we allow both of those things to change, both energy and entropy. And what's interesting about that is that reality doesn't respect our constraints. Reality had energy and entropy changing all the time. We just carefully picked systems where only the energy part mattered. Okay, so we started with uh, energy being able to change, then we relaxed a constraint and allowed entry to be, entropy to be allowed to change, which allowed us to deal with more complex systems. Then as we move to thinking about uh, the behavior, modeling behavior of fluids, what we're secretly doing when we say fugacity equals fugacity, we're really doing a lot of the same balances, but we're using different equations to look at it because those equations focus in on whatever is most interesting to us at the time. For example, fugacity equals fugacity being something that's true at phase equilibrium. So what we've been solving there, and this is the equation I make the case we're solving all along, is we're minimizing uh, Gibbs free energy. And delta G equals delta H minus T delta S in broad circumstances. And so when we thought about energy and entropy, there's that delta H, T delta S, the, that stuff, we were solving this equation, but we didn't choose to solve it in, the, in this particular way uh, because solving delta G equals delta H minus T delta S doesn't tell us most of what we need to know. We could just focus on the energy and entropy and get to where we needed to go. Uh, fluids, we brought delta G in a little bit, but we hit it behind fugacity. As we come into reactions, we hit the place where really most of the time it finally makes sense to be thinking about Gibbs free energy, even though, as I said, we have thought about it all along. So we're using that same equation, but this time the constraint we have relaxed. Not only can things change phase, not only are there multiple components, not only is everything a mixture, not only is there energy and entropy change, but now bonds can move around. Uh, this is the last constraint we're going to relax. And so we are looking at, straight at, delta G change uh, equaling delta H minus T delta S. And even though we've been looking at it all along, this is the version where, um, since we've taken off all of the limits that had us looking at kind of smaller pieces of the puzzle, this is where we get things to be their most complex. And of course, reality has been this way all along. Things could have been reacting. We just chose situations to look at where reactions were small or unlikely to happen. So let's figure out how to work in this space.
So what's the governing equation that we're going to be solving here? It's really uh, that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, but we uh, make a few assumptions and replacements in the algebra to turn this into something that uh, works with the models we're likely to use and more directly answers the questions that we tend to have. So how are we going to do this? Our governing equation at equilibrium, and again, you can go check uh, either online, this is in Wikipedia, uh, and certainly please check your textbook for this full derivation. But we can go leaping straight to uh, the, uh, the uh, endpoint, which is at uh, in equilibrium for a reacting system. So that usually means like when we think of as the reaction is done, when it has reached its equilibrium state. Um, and uh, in the case where we are not uh, also looking at a phase change, that's kind of embedded in here, but not embedded well in here. So let's just think of it this way. We have zero equals uh, delta G of formation changed for uh, this temperature uh, plus RT, uh, sum of all, uh, sum of stoichiometric number times, and then what's going to be here? Uh, fugacity of the R component with a hat divided by the standard state fugacity. Um, and there you go. That's, that is our governing equation. And you say, ha, huh, that looks kind of familiar, that fugacity with a hat divided by fugacity with a zero. Where did I see that before? You saw it before as the definition of activity. So chemical activity uh, is same thing here. So at reaction equilibrium, we have uh, the, the delta G of formation for our reaction corrected to this current temperature. And then uh, we also have RT times summation, nu I times AI. And this is our, uh, our equilibrium condition. And where you've seen some of this before, probably, uh, has been in determining uh, that, that overall delta G, if not at reaction temperature, certainly at standard state. You have probably done this before because it is the uh, sum of uh, stoichiometric number times delta G of formation for products minus stoichiometric number times delta G of formation for reactants, you know, uh, absolute value. And uh, you, you might have calculated this in Gen Chem, for example. I do have a little extra narration that uh, extends beyond the video for uh, solving these problems. So remember that when we're thinking about fugacity, it's fugacity of I in the mixture divided by the standard state fugacity uh, or activity, and we're thinking of those as the same thing. So what's going to happen to these equations that look kind of complex is that first term, the delta G, is going to be calculated first from the delta G of formation information that's tabulated at the back of the book. And then that second term, the RT summation, is uh, going to be solved for, um, is going to be what we solve for, because it's what we're going to get our concentrations out of. Thanks. So to keep moving along this journey, having defined our governing equation, now we need to define another useful term, which is the equilibrium constant, capital K sub A. Um, and it is defined as capital pi, which is not osmotic pressure. It's a different meaning of capital pi. So I will characterize that for you in a moment uh, uh, of AI to the new I power, uh, which is again, the same thing, remembering the definition of activity, fugacity with a hat uh, divided by standard state fugacity raised to the stoichiometric number power. Okay. And those capital pi's are the mathematical symbol for multiplication of everything together, kind of like uh, summation. So capital sigma is adding everything together. This is uh, for i equals 1 to whatever the number is, uh, multiplying all those things together. So you get a, a, a string of values, activity of component 1 raised to stoichiometric number 1 times activity of component 2 raised to stoichiometric number 2.
etc etc so for example just to put this in numbers to make it easier for you to, to think about if we did capital pi of a sub i and a uh, was equal to uh, there were three components in the system and uh, where a i a sub 1 is the value 2 and a sub 2 is the value 4 and a sub 3 is the value 3 uh, the answer to this calculation would be 2 times 4 times 3 which we can work out uh, here, we're mostly, uh, when we are working with this, we are mostly working symbolically. So it'll be uh, activities all times each other, just written as letters, not quite so often as numerical values. So now we can put together all the stuff I just said. Um, and this isn't quite a derivation, but it's kind of derivation-like. So there's th three pieces uh, to the puzzle here. We have our equilibrium condition. Uh, we have our definition of equilibrium constant, Ka. Uh, and we will have the calculation of standard state uh, Gibbs, uh, Gibbs free energy for the reaction. So Ka is pi Ai to the new i. And remember, Ai is the same thing as saying uh, the ratio of the fugacities. We'll use one or other of these depending on if we're talking uh, about a liquid mixture that's our reaction or a vapor mixture uh, most often. Um, then we have uh, delta G adjusted for temperature for our reaction, which is the sum of uh, nu I times uh, delta G of formation, um, products minus reactants, and corrected for temperature. We will talk in the future in another video about how you do the temperature correction. For right now, you can just think of this as something that you do when you look up in the back of the book. So you go uh, to a table where it has standard state Gibbs free energies and you do products minus reactants multiplied by their stoichiometric numbers and you get a value for the reaction. And then uh, overall, we also have our equilibrium condition, which is the zero equals delta G uh, adjusted for temperature plus RT um, sum of nu i times natural log a i. And when you put all that together and feed it through the algebra machine, and in fact this is not too much of an algebra machine, you can see that we have a substitution that works pretty well coming up, uh, we get a nice compact equation that tells us what reactions do when they reach equilibrium, uh, which is this. You have Ka equals e to the negative delta g over rt, something you've probably seen before, right? Think back. You, you may have used this before. And remember that delta G is temperature corrected. Uh, and that is then also equal to pi, capital pi, remember, we talked about this, uh, AI to the new I. And that's it. This is what we do uh, at equilibrium for reactions. So reaction equilibrium, we, we uh, work out, as I say in the notes, each of these pieces separately. And what this allows us to do is uh, at a given temperature and pressure, we can solve, uh, oh, and a given initial concentration, uh, composition, we can figure out what the final composition at reaction equilibrium will be. And so that's a, a good thing for us to be able to answer as chemical engineers, right? Like as chemical engineers, when a reaction happens, we wanna know what we've got when it's done. So that helps us answer this question. So finally, today's actual problem of the day, what I want you to work on. We're gonna have a home base reaction that we keep returning to. Uh, and in fact, this was introduced earlier in the class when we talked about the reaction energy balance. This reaction is the water gas shift reaction. Uh, and it's a useful model because one, it uh, is equilibrium limited. So depending on what conditions we set, we get very different uh, results from this reaction. Uh, in fact, in a, quite a lot of conditions, the products are favored more strongly over the reactants, uh, or I just said that backwards, the reactants are favored more strongly over the products um, as this reaction proceeds. And uh, another name for this is steam reformation of, of methane. And the other reason why this is a 
practical reaction to talk about is it is industrially useful. It creates what's called syn gas, that CO plus uh, hydrogen uh, at the outlet. We can use that to make a whole bunch of stuff. So it's, it's a nice generator of raw materials from an abundant resource, which is the methane. So our, our reaction, methane plus steam. So all of this is gas phase, by the way, right? So three of those things are gases pretty much all the time, but water may or may not be a gas. In this case, it's a gas. So methane plus water goes to CO and uh, 3H2. And this is a equilibrium constrained reaction. So sometimes you get products, sometimes you stick with reactants, sometimes things just go in the other direction. So what I want you to do is uh, calculate what is delta G for this reaction at 298K, which means you don't have to do any temperature correction because 298K is the uh, temperature at which our values are compiled. It's the standard state. And I'm putting the equation there to remind you how that works. Um, you may also want to go back in your notes and look up the delta H of reaction for this particular reaction. Remind yourself what that was. Is this reaction endothermic, exothermic? What do we expect there? Maybe note that down for yourselves. And again, at 298 only. We will do the temperature change shortly. Okay, and then the second thing I want you to do is uh, take that uh, delta G T at 298K and work out for me what is Ka. So that is E to the negative delta G over RT. Figure out that number. That's, that's going to be our problem for today. A reminder I want to give you as you do this is watch your units because most of the time the R that we think of off the top of our heads is in joules per mole K, but delta G's and delta H's are uh, compiled in general in uh, kilojoules per mole. And so there's a factor of a thousand that you'll really want to pay attention to.